How are you entrepreneurs? Today we have Ryan Berman. He is the founder of Courageous. So he has a, a really interesting story where he talks about how he moved from New York to San Diego to actually make films. Uh, he's here in San Diego, staying at a friend's house, just trying to help him out, build this um, ad brand. And by helping them out, he actually uh, won this pitch with their kind of startup company. And from there on, they started building it out, built it around 70 people, then transitioned there uh, to actually Courageous, put out a book. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool story to kind of hear him out. He goes over the idea of helping people figure out their message. Um, so I think for anyone listening right now, if you're trying to figure out your message, you're trying to figure out basically what your company stands for. You might already have your why, but you're trying to figure out how to share that with the masses. Listen to this one. Of course, describe, tell your friends, and we'd always love to hear your feedback. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with real estate agent Vinny SD. All right, so we are here with Ryan Berman, uh, the founder of Courageous. You own a business also too, part of the Courageous brand. Um, and you do some coaching, kind of help people reinvent themselves. Kind of, there's a lot of stuff to, to unwrap right there. Let's <laughs> yeah. let's just get into it. Sure. Yeah. Hey. By the way, thanks for uh, just so the the, the audience knows, uh, Vinny came to me. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that he 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 hauled all the way up here to North County. So I, thanks for coming up here. Yeah. No problem. Uh, so yeah, it's been a quite quite a ride. It's uh, where where do you want to start? Well, well, you're talking about that mini win right there that that you got. You have a, a event coming up in January. I'm not, the the pla- the podcast should be out by then yeah but yeah I'd love to talk about that off yeah I mean so so I guess in, I think to set it up and maybe create a scotch of a cliffhanger yeah. you know, my background I mean I, I'm a I came out of the advertising arena you know I learned that back in '98 in New York City that um, courageous or creative business ideas was what we were trying to help companies achieve and form and after doing that for seven years in the city. Um, I moved out to San Diego thinking I was uh, coming here to write movies, uh, not live one. And uh, literally the very first month after being here was presented an opportunity to open up my own first uh, creative ad agency. And this is back in, gosh, 04. Uh, we were four people out of a house, really had no idea what we were doing. And I, I wonder if anyone really does. I know as a guy that went to television radio school, and had taken like four business classes, <laughs> like probably the least qualified person. So, so did you move to San Diego with those other three other people? No, no, I moved here. The deal was, um, so after nine eleven, I had a very good couple friend from the city that were like, "We're out of here," and so they were like, "Where can we go where we can be happy?" <laughs> and they chose San Diego. Chuck, um, the the woman was a very talented strategist. And she needed help. So the idea was I was going to live rent-free in their house and help them position the company, um, the company she was at. And the, she was trying to turn a photography studio into an ad agency. Uh-huh. And so I was like, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll come out, uh, you know, pay me a little bit, but really let me live rent-free and write movies from the beach, and I'll help you on the side. And, and you know, I move out here, and it's like, a weekend and they have this big pitch and I'm like, what are you guys doing for this? They're like, I wouldn't do it this way. I would try this. Um, next thing you know, I'm like living at this photography studio. Uh, we're a week away from the pitch and the pitch is in New York. And the photographer's like, what you guys, I'm not flying you out to the pitch. I'm like, well, if, if we're not there, there's no way we're going to win the business. So I end up paying for the team to go. And, um, in the room, we we basically crushed it, and the to the point where the CEO turned to the head of marketing, like, "What do we need that other partner for? Let's use these these guys." Um, and the CEO pulled us aside after and said, "If you guys like knock this project out of the park, we'll we'll give you we'll give you the business." Well, at the point, it was pretty much just me, the strategist, one other person, and a designer, and uh, we 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 nailed the project. And uh, ended up resigning from the photographer who wouldn't fly us out to the pitch. And that's how our first company started, which was oh. called Fish Tank. So, again, it wasn't like, I'm so smart and there's the white space and here's my business plan. It was literally opportunity, um, you know, a couple brains, computers, 
So let's see what we can do. And um, so this is so this is 2011. This is 2004. 2004. So literally, I'm, so the idea from the, the from the first week of landing in San Diego to the first month, I went from I think I'm writing movies from the beach to what's an LLC? <laughs> 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 and like creating a corporation. And um, you know, um, the amazing thing is, seven years later from that, we we I ended up buying out her, buying out a partner. Uh, ended up merging the company with another, grew it to 70 people, um, which is now today known as IDEA up in uh, downtown San Diego. Awesome stuff. And um, I, I'm getting to your actual question, which says this could be a long podcast. But, um, you know, my plan, when we, when we finally got to 70 people, I felt like it was the first time I could I could be on the business, not in the business. Yeah. Right. And that was when. I started looking at courage and the concept of, wow, really the, the thing that's the big differentiator is the courageous idea. Um, and then when I kind of looked further, I was like, wow, there's no way you get to a courageous idea without a courageous leader. Because uh, it's the courageous leader that creates courageous leaders, and then that's what empowers a courageous culture. And then hopefully you get a shot at courageous innovation and courageous ideas. So this thing that I thought was super narrow at first turned out to be absurdly wide. And it grabbed me because when I, although I didn't realize it at the time, almost every decision that I feel like I had made over the last 15 years was the courageous one. I just didn't have awareness of it. Hmm. Um, So you fast forward to what turned into being a book, which is called Return on Courage, came out in January. And um, what's come from that is like a ton of speaking opportunities. The big joke is I wrote the book to position my last company and it, it gave me the courage to fire myself. And to yeah. move on and uh, and to start courageous. And so now courageous, there's a leadership side of it. There's a there's a marketing side of it. Um, there's a training side of it. And it's really helping companies reinvent themselves. So in January, this is the conversation we were having right before. I just got word that I'm um, the keynote speaker at a fairly large event in New York City in, in January. Um, because contracts aren't signed, I won't say who it is yet. But it's sort of a nice data point that the message is resonating. I've probably spoken now on 50 stages, really trying to inspire people, sort of delicately nudge them out of their comfort zone um, to consider reinvention. And then we talk a whole slew about our why in this society, know your why, find your why. And I think, of course, it's important to know your why. But once you've locked in on that why, what I'm not seeing is anyone delivering the how. Like, what? how do I do? How do I actually fulfill on this why? And so... I never thought in a million years that I would be a guy with a method. I'm a guy with the method. Um, and again, the, it's it's sort of laid out in Return on Courage. But as an observationalist, all I did was connect the dots from the people I got to interview along the way. Super successful people from Apple and Google and Amazon and Apple and put it into a process that people could replicate for themselves. So I, I think there's a lot of stuff to unwrap right there. So the idea is... And most of the times when you're talking about it, it's so a courageous leader builds courageous leaders, and then the courageous idea comes from all the different leaders or the people you've been in place, or is there kind of a rhyme or reason? Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's it's kind of like imagine you walk into a, an office for the first time and you're yeah. like something's up here, like it's, it's too quiet, <laughs> you yeah. know, it feels sort of dusty. You can actually feel almost the fear that's permeating throughout the culture it's it's not a it's not a green light culture it's probably a red light culture or yellow light culture or you walk into another room and you can feel the energy you can feel there's music playing people are maybe it's an open floor people are smiling people are are actually walking around and usually maybe that's a green light culture and what i've learned is that you know there's some uh, some cultures where fear really runs the roost and i believe fear breeds fear and conversely I think courage is a muscle that could be learned. So courage breeds courage. And when you're actually in a a culture that's courageous and people are empowered to experiment and to be curious and to try new things, even if it's a air quoting right now, a failure, it's really not a failure, is it? It's like an opportunity to learn something, to push forward to what's next. So to me, that goes back to the courageous leader who's empowering other people to be courageous, who are empowering a culture of people to be um, experiment, experimenting with the processes and programs that the company is putting forward. Um, and yeah, it's just like, it's like a snowball, right? Like it starts getting bigger and bigger and your job is to make sure the snowball doesn't melt. What what did it take for you to, to actually fire yourself, to kind of walk away from that, 
that thing you built yeah. from just a couple of people to 70, 70 plus? Yeah, I think it was sort of a combination of uh, of events. It started with, and I don't think this is a new idea, this first part, mm-hmm. but I'm a creative creature at first, and then we get to a point where we're so big that in order for the organization to continue to grow, then I need to move on into management. So, like, I moved from the thing I love doing most, which is thinking and creating and crafting. Or maybe I did it to myself, but I know this is not a, like, I'm, I'm not the only person. Mm-hmm. I needed to get out of the way, basically, of other creative people. Was Was there, like, a, a stagnant feeling that put you there? Because I know... I, I've heard people talk before where they go, I take, I took a vacation. I, I started realizing when I took vacation, more stuff was happening in the business. Or yeah, I it- just felt like, I mean, the way I've described it is, in, in a good way, I empowered other people. Like, my executive creative director was a super, super talented guy, and, like, he doesn't need me to meddle with his stuff. He's, yeah. that's why we pay him, yeah. right? So, so that freedom opened me up to go explore this concept of courage, and I'm grateful for that. And I got to write the book off of that. And so I I was using my creativity in different ways. But then when I started to apply what I was learning on the journey, I realized that I didn't have some of the basic tenets of what I was talking about in the book to take the company to the next level. So how ironic I look back at myself as if, if I believe in this process, which I do, then I don't sense that I'm the most effective leader for this organization the way it is. So, And if I'm writing a book about courage, then you kind of have to live the premise, right? And so, I mean, if I'm saying I'm courageous, but I'm safely sitting back in my company like a fifth-year senior coasting, shame on me. Um, So I think it was a combination of those things where I was like, okay, this facet of my life is nearing an end, and I'm moving into the next part of growth. And absurdly scary because I have no idea if it's going to work out. Um, but I felt like in my heart, how could I not follow what I'm learning in the book, which is what a courageous act is. And I think any business leader or person taking a bet um, has calculated the risks. One of my mentors says there's a big difference between what's risky and what, what's a risk. And I believe 100% in that. And so the risk for me was, okay, what's the worst that could happen? I, I have to go back to agency life somewhere. And the best that can happen is I get to fulfill out this journey of helping people be courageous and pushing forward. Because you succeeded in tr- transitioning from writing a, a movie, right, when you came to San Diego originally, and then you kind of were forced into this kind of ad agency, right? Yeah. Was there ever a moment of time where you were like, I need to get back to writing that movie? Yeah, it's so funny. Um, I believe that I'll get back to it. It's just where I'm at right now. I'm so in it. I am in the journey. Like I'm, and I'm at peace with that. And, and I love it. I mean, I love what I'm doing. So like, I'm totally fine with where I am. Like, I guess I sort of visualize how this going really running hard for the next five years and, and trying to like go around the country and help nudge people. Like I said, to be more courageous and help them through that process. And then my hope is to come out the other side when my kids are like, I don't know, 10, seven, be around and write and write and have fun doing it. Now, I don't know how this is going to flip and turn, but like, at least in my head, that's how I see it going. What's, what's been kind of one or the two different struggles that you've had to kind of uh, readjust to uh, in this kind of new career? Yeah. Number one, I mean, I do have partners on the, on courageous. So the, Imagine there's a whiteboard and, and you broke the whiteboard into uh, four components. So there's a speaking speaking side to the business, which is, you know, you're, now I'm getting compensated to go share the, the, the research, right? Like I describe most of the talks like, um, you know, the, the front half is the why now of all things. Do I believe courage is what's missing? And then how? How do you do it? Um, the second is the consulting practice. Well, my partners and I are... You know, we're on missions right now. I call them missions, mission of record uh, for project for, for Johnson Johnson, for uh, Gibson Guitars and Caesars Palace. So, like, we're working on really, like, cool stuff, and we're trying to help them, you know, clarify their messaging and their stories to push forward. Um, I'll fa- the big issue is that in this new model, and I don't think we're alone, it's a virtual world, you know, so my partners aren't aren't in San Diego. One of them is, but one of them isn't. Um, the partners we partner with, some are here, some aren't. Um, so I miss, 
I miss the fact that it's hard to build a culture when we're not all in the same place. You go from being around 70 people, you know, hopefully all with the right intention of like making magic. And then you go, you step away from that. And so as a, as a social, as a social creature, it's hard to like, like not have people around all the time. I'm so used to that. Have you, have you thought of any ways to incorporate a culture in this, this digital world? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just the reality of where we are in our, I mean, we're, we're a new company, you know, and we've got, I mean, I describe us as like a special forces team. So it's not like we don't have experience, you know, but we swoop in and swoop out as needed. Uh, but with success, I, my sense is we're going to grow. And with that growth, we'll have an opportunity to, to create new types of cultures. Does that mean it's uh, the new the new boardroom is like a Zoom meeting? Hmm. Absolutely. You know, could it also mean um, standardizing uh, like a best practice where quarterly we're all in the same place on the first Monday of a month? Absolutely. There's to me, I think that's it's the discipline to set up process to put yourself in a position to be successful and to create consistent results. And I think that's the hard part is like this inconsistent behavior or this sort of schizophrenic leadership behavior where one day you're this and the next day you're that. And so I think the sooner you ritualize your processes, the sooner you have a chance to, to lead people because they know what's expected of them. Yeah. The, there was, I heard this uh, one guy say this once, uh, the idea is, the difference between uh, a good team and a great team is the good team focuses on each transaction and each kind of deal for you guys, but the great team focuses on the systems. Yeah. So every time there's an issue or something they have about, figure out how you can fix the systems so yeah. future. Exactly. That well, so so that's a great lead into like the biggest surprise of the book writing journey for me. So by far the so like again I went to television radio school so like I have no idea how we're wired and so <laughs> I had my uh, I got lucky that I found like a very patient brain sherpa. His name is Nicholas Alp, uh, Cambridge PhD. Uh, we probably Skyped every other week. And he kind of cracked open the decision maker, the brain, and articulated what's really going on in there. And so the big aha for me was when you realize that this thing called your central nervous system is calling all the shots. So, like, let's break this down. Central, at the core of you, system, operating system, your computer, nervous. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't try that. Don't consider that. Um, and that's our standard That's our standard decision-making process procedure is nervous. So how do you reprogram that? And, um, you know, again, the, the research that I, that I was able to, to – the interviews process, I came out the other side with, with what I call, like, your central – courage system to combat the realities of your central nervous system. So if you can actually learn how to build a central courage system for yourself and you look at all the data, which says that 95% of us are freeze or flight and you can be part of the 5% that fights, well, that would be a massive competitive advantage for you. Like if you're in a room of a hundred people and only five of you are fighters and you know, everybody else is spinning just because that's their standard operating system then, oh my gosh, what a competitive advantage that would be for you in your life if you can continue to reinvent and move and go knowing that everybody else is going to be stuck. So, well, a couple of things off of that is converting that nervousness to the courageous kind of mindset. Is it rewarding basically the activities of being courageous? Is it a more of a mindset thing, meditation thing? Yes. What's great question. So I think this is, um, so let's say this, this uh, podcast comes out in January. Yeah. Um, we did record it in November. Yeah. Uh, so it's November, 2019. Almost every company on the planet has probably gone through some sort of planning for 2020. So, so they spent a lot of time on goal set, right? They've got their goal set situations, hopefully on lockdown. And then what most people do is then mirror that goal set to skill set. Who are the people that can bring this to life? Oh, well, they know those programs. They know how to do this. And rarely anyone is focused on mindset. So it's like, to me, if it's not about, you're, you're going to do the goal setting that you've done that your whole career. We know the skill set. We know how that applies. But what about the mindset? Like, how do we get the mindset right of the team to push forward? And so where you need clarity to make decisions quickly, and I think time is a huge issue for so many people today. We are, I've never seen us so time starved for so many different reasons. So if I could help you pick up um, decision making time on mindset decisions, that's really what's um, on the inside of the book. And it's helping you decide like, why are you wired the way that you are? 
get clarity there so you can surround yourself with other like-minded people that share your values that maybe bring a breadth of experience, right? So you can actually go and make uh, faster calculated decisions. So besides that, that kind of that one hurdle of um, the culture and so on and so forth, has there been any other things that you've had to look at and kind of reassess yourself from yeah. maybe even, even back in the day when you were coming from the, the, the film institution kind of thing the college? Yeah. <laughs> and then to, well, I mean, yeah, let's, we got to go way back. So, yeah. you know, this is, this is the, uh, like the Oprah Winfrey part of the show, which is <laughs> I think what you want. Right. So, so growing up my the, I had an older brother yeah. and he's four and a half years older. And like, if I was ever on who wants to be a millionaire, he's my phone call by four, by far. Like he's, he's off the charts. And, um, I think, I grew up in Potomac, Maryland. Not a not a terrible place to grow up. I don't know if you know the area at all. <laughs> no, no. Sorry. I mean, it, the the only way to possibly describe it is it's uh, Darren Starr who created uh, Beverly Hills 90210 is from Potomac, Maryland. Okay. Okay. I'm pretty sure the the original show title was 20854. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. <laughs> so we grew up in a in a part of town where we where we had the luxury of not being like in true Maslow country. Um, Mask on the, the, the addition that I had an older brother that was sort of the chosen one smart. So the way we were branded as kids, he was a smart one and I was good with people, which I equated to as, oh, I must, I must be the dumb one. My <laughs> brother's the, the smart one. So this is what's been, I've chosen to have stuck on my central nervous system from the beginning. It's a story I made up and told myself is that he must be the smart one. And I'm I must not be the smart one. And and when you live in a three car garage family, how and you're told that you're supposed to do better than the last generation and you are competitive, it's it's hard to think like, well, how am I going to do this? Like he got all the opportunity. And now, again, this is in my head. This isn't the truth. And like, how am I going to overcome all this? So now looking back on it, I laugh because it. I am good with people. Like it actually is my super skill is to be a good listener and like really understand what people aren't saying when they're talking. Um, I always like to say, hear what's not being said and then try to smoke that out and bring that out and bring that to the forefront. And I think once I sort of embraced that part of who I was, not only to like allow me to breathe and smile, but it allowed me to be who I am. Um, and look at the situation I'm in now or what am I really doing but connecting with people. You know, whether I'm on a stage of 100 people, 500 people having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Like my, my only hope is like am I getting you to think just a little bit differently about the situation that you're in, you know, to move you forward. Uh, it's worked for me, you know, and so – and it doesn't mean that just because it's working for me is going to work for you exactly that way. But like that's just the journey that I'm on. And I think this is – since we already sort of dropped other things we've talked about before this conversation – I think that's the philosophy part. Yeah. I mean, that's the part where you're going, wow, it's amazing how we're all on our own version of this, this world. We're all doing our own journeys, trying to figure it out for ourselves and what's going to work for you may not work for me, but like I'm rooting for you and I commend you for like the things that you're doing as you try to press forward. You mean, this is usually the part where I kind of ask the idea of what would you say to your younger self? I think you, you, you encapsulate a lot of that stuff you'd already kind of say right there. Is there anything yeah. specifically that maybe someone listening that that might feel that they're not as good as maybe their their peers or their <laughs> sibling or whatever it might be like. Yeah, I'll tell you. So I have a six year old son <laughs> and a four year old daughter, and so I wish someone would have said this to me when I was like their age. I say it to them all the time, hmm. but uh, but I think it plays perfectly here. And it's when you compare, beware. You know, and it's hard not to compare. But I think when you compare, beware, and you have to find. Like, again, this is why I think clarity is so important for yourself. We spend so much time scrolling social media versus scrolling ourselves of what's important to us. Um, and when you can sort of create your own barometer or North Star for success for yourself, <clears throat> you're not looking around at everybody else, then I think you can stay focused on the things that you want. Uh, it doesn't mean you're, you know, we're all human. You're going to, of course, sort of like set barometers from what you see of other things out in the marketplace. But you know, my, my younger self was comparing myself, uh, to, to my dad or my, or my brother even. And I didn't have the context even to do that, frankly, until way later in my life. Um, and now I'm grateful for sort of like the makeup of me that came from my parents. I've got my, my father's grit and savviness and I've got my mom's tact and sweetness and try to bring that forward in all the work that I'm doing. 
What's uh, so? What's next? What's next for yourself? What's next for the brand? What's yeah? I mean, I'm I'm so in it right mm. now. Like I'm, I think it's just to continue to get the word out on what we're doing. That we think that people should be more courageous. That companies need to be more courageous. That it doesn't mean you have to be the CEO to be a leader inside an organization to be courageous and to unlock it. And I just want to continue to go down this path um, and help people unlock their teams or reinvent their businesses. Uh, we do have our Courage Boot Camp, which is an eight-week online program. It's really like an hour a week, hmm. frankly, um, recognizing how time-starved everybody is. But just trying to democratize training. Um, when I talk to HR professionals, it seems like almost all of their time is on recruiting, not on retention. Um, and when you retain the wrong people, that's not good. So it's pinpointing which people they should be keeping. And it's also helping leadership uh, basically see how off they are on what they thought the problems were inside their organization versus what the problems actually are. Is, so is it interactive class? or It's all online. It's all on couragebootcamp.com. And, and, you know, to me, again, it's it's all programmed in, and there's almost 250 questions with throughout the program. It just doesn't doesn't feel that way because they're they're sort of sprinkled out throughout the, the, the boot camp. And going back to the, the ad agency, I'd be very curious. It, are you able to walk through, like, the, the process that it was, maybe when you were just getting started or what it is now? Like, so you met with a company or you meet with a company. They give you an idea of what they're looking to do. Yeah. Kind of what, what's that process look like? Um, I mean, in layman terms, yeah. it's as simple as clients need help clarifying why they exist. What's mm. the product that they're bringing to market? Why is that important? I always like to say no feel, no deal. So if we're, if we're not emotional with our messaging, good luck. Um, you know, we usually justify it later with logic, with the mm. rationale, but as imperfect creatures, we're, we're, we need to be moved. Um, and in a world where we're inundated with thousands of, of messages every day and we're living in this media obese time if you don't have emotion in your idea good luck so it's like clarifying but then sort of amplifying that clarity um, nestled in a wrapper right of emotion which starts the conversation and brings people back to what it is that you're bringing to market so would the company give you the what their emotional key was or was it you had to figure it out? No, we would have to figure it out. So they would come to us and be like, hey, we're whether it's like we're launching a new brand or mm. we have this new product, can you help us market it to the to the masses? Um, and then we would, it would be our job to then take that, um, that brief, that strategy, if they had one, or we would be writing the strategy and getting confirmation on it and then recognizing that we're flooded with content. How do we stand out in this the sea? right of, st of sameness especially when we're not there to defend the idea in person right it's you're driving down the five and there's a billboard i can't be like meh, meh, hey look at that one <laughs> yeah. so to me i think it's understanding that we have to work harder to make sure people see those messages um and then from there it's our our, our belief is there's so many fragmented places now to, for you to put a message but you're still looking for one whole idea. What's the courageous concept that can be right sized to live in small places like your phone or billboard or maybe it's at an event and so on. It, it would seem like that could be a hard, um, hard thing to, to turn off. Like the creative, when the creative juices start going. Yeah, no question. And, and so, so how have you learned to, to adapt, especially with having a kid, family, that kind of thing to... To say when I'm home, I'm not thinking about it, or is it? I would say my wife would be laughing right now <laughs> if she was sitting here. I mean, um, but go back to like, if you love what you do, you know, then you're just sort of grateful that you you found something that you're passionate about. Um, you know, my business is like a crossword puzzle, and the answers don't come out the next day. Like if you don't figure it out, you're messed. You know, you're screwed. <laughs> and so, so I like that challenge. This is not a. This is not a khakis job. This is like a, you know, an accountant job. This is a, if you like different every day and you like challenges and you're a problem slayer, then you're going to see some cool problems. And gosh, now the cool thing I think is after doing this for 20 years and seeing so many different verticals, mm -hmm. you learn that innovation sometimes is by taking something in one vertical and bringing it into a completely different vertical. And because most people in that vertical have only spent time in that vertical they have blinders on of what's working in other places. And like being in advertising, someone once described it to me as like, we get to live all these short stories while most people are in novels. 
And so we're taking what we're learning from a short story over here and blending it in with a new short story. What, um, I mean, that goes into kind of my next question. I, so I had a, another a gentleman on, Rom, and he put a lot of um, business plans together for people. And they just tell him, I want to open up a store. I like that. And he just has to put everything together. And so he was like, I was able to open businesses because I learned from all these, like you're saying, short stories to put them. Yep. So what do you think some of the, the biggest takeaways you've actually accumulated from all the different companies, like all the different ad, um, ads you put together for your own uh, courageous brand? Yeah, I would say... Um Usually, the more you listen, the more you hear gems that other people have missed. Mm -hmm. And then it's applying those gems in a way where people haven't seen it or thought about it. You know, so you're like, okay, how do I, okay, so that's a great strategy. Now, how do we bring that to life in a way that people will actually buy in on it? And the other thing that's really kind of cool about our gig is that it's kind of like this podcast. Like I'm working on something now that's not going to come out till January. Yeah. So I'm throwing ideas into the future, hoping that society catches up by the time it lands, which is cool. It's like the arc. Imagine yeah. <laughs> this arc of an idea that gravity will eventually have it land in March of next year. And all you can hope for is that society has, is ready for the idea. And you always hear timing is everything. And so our business is also teaching people the importance of, okay, if I'm too early or too late, I miss, yeah. right? So thinking through that as well. So for anyone listening right now, what's the best way for them to follow for upcoming events you might have to join the boutique? I know you were talking about a little bit. Yeah. What's the best platforms? Um, well, there's a, lot, there's a lot. I should probably be clear myself. <laughs> um, I think I would start it at returnoncourage.com, yeah. which is where you can like learn about the book. And if you like the book, then – you know, maybe then there's a reason for you to continue following what I'm doing. If you don't like the book, that's cool too, and I'm probably not the right person for you to follow. Uh, I think you can also find me at ryanberman.com. Um, I will say one of the big aha moments from this whole experience is I do feel like I have clarity in who I am as a person, and that comes down to helping people take a personal core values assessment. So if anyone wants to take it, email me at ryanberman at couragebrands.com. I will send it to you for free. Uh, I find this to be like just the best thing for anybody who's really like serious about getting to know why they are wired the way they're wired. Hmm. Well, thanks again. Hopefully everyone listening got some great tidbits. I mean, you really got I, I think one of the big things I took away was just the idea that you, ha you really have to listen to other people. Like you can, yeah. you can shape the people, but you got to listen to them. When yeah. you, shape them so. <laughs> you can, you can talk down to them, you yeah. know, I mean, but it, I don't know how, successful you'll be right so like are you really are you really hearing what people are saying and often people are fumbling through they're trying to get to the thing so yeah. they're like working it out and again your job is to be like oh okay that's what you're you're coping with or that's that's what we want to celebrate like let's do more of that i think that's what good coaches do too right yeah. it's like listen rep uh, replay back and then provide some sort of counsel well thanks again ryan um everyone listening please subscribe please share uh, get Ryan's book and, and follow him. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Road to Growth, Success of an Entrepreneur. Please like, subscribe, and stay connected. Visit www.vinniesd.com. Yeah, I created a website. Hope to see you again next week. Team Vinny SD, signing off.